My name's um, Molly Courtney. I'm a professor at um, Cardiff University. Um, my, my role at Cardiff is mainly research, and I've done a, a lot of research with um, non-medical healthcare professionals who can prescribe medicines. Um, and through that work, I branched out into the area of um, antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. So I've been invited here today to talk about um, a competency framework um, that we developed for undergraduate healthcare professional um, students. Oh, that's right. Okay, so... Oh, hang on, wait a minute. I see. All right. Okay, so there was a lot of people, collaborat collaborators work with us on this work. So that's a list of collaborators there. So you can see we've got people from um, Reading University, Imperial College, Public Health England, the Royal College of Nursing, College of Podiatry, um, and the Society of, sorry, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, to name but a few. So basically, just a little bit of background. So the edu education of undergraduate healthcare professional students on antimicrobial resistance has been identified as it's a key activity for the containment of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and student ed stewardship, ed antimicrobial stewardship education in undergraduate healthcare professionals, though it sadly, is lacking and it's disparate. Um, so Enrique, for example, has done a, a study with undergraduate healthcare professional ed um, students and found that nurses, for example, there's probably only about 12% of programmes contain all the principles for antimicrobial stu stewardship. So, there's, and there's a need, the evidence in the literature suggested that there was a need to adopt, adopt a comprehensive approach and standardised content. So at the moment, although we've got a, for nursing at any rate, we've got a standard out there for um, antimicrobial stewardship, it doesn't actually tell you what should be taught in the curriculum. So there's only sort of one standard, and it's up to, up to educators to identify what it is that they need to teach. So that, that was kind of what gave it the impetus for this work. Um, so there are antimicrobial and prescribing stewardship competencies available for prescribers. So dentists and doctors that come out from their undergraduate training and can prescribe medicines, there are stewardship competencies for those groups. And there are competencies available for nurses, pharmacists and allied health professionals that prescribe medicines. But you've got this kind of gap for those healthcare professionals that don't prescribe medicines, that don't, sorry, that don't prescribe but are dealing with antibiotics. So, for example, Enrique and I were talking about the figures earlier. You've got sort of six, six with regards to nursing, you've got 640, about 650,000 nurses and there's about 5,000, 45,000 of those nurses, so 5% of that group can prescribe medicines. But there's an awful lot of them, that group, that don't prescribe medicines. It's the same with pharmacists. You've got about 50,000 pharmacists, I think, across England and there's a, around 8% that actually prescribe. But nonetheless, the, the non-prescribing, those, those that aren't prescribing are still dealing with antibiotics. And there's no sort of guidance out there um, about what they should be doing. So there's no competencies available for those healthcare professionals that don't go on to prescribe. So what we decided to do was to, um, to, provide, to get consensus on a common set of antimicrobial stewardship competencies appropriate for undergraduate healthcare professional education designed to address the various patient and medicine related stewardship activities in which healthcare professionals are involved. So, you know, we're, as, as different groups of healthcare professionals, nurses, ph pharmacists, allied health professionals, we're all involved in different stewardship activities. Um, and it was, so it's, they're not involved in prescribing, but they are involved in other activities. So it was those activities that we wanted to develop a set of competencies for. So what we, how we did it was, was we did a modified Delphi approach comprising of two online surveys delivered to a UK national panel of 21 individuals reflecting expertise in prescribing and medicines management with regard to the education practice of healthcare professionals and antimicrobial prescribing and stewardship. So we got this 21 expert panel. There were members from um, actually the people on the paper, so the people that I listed in the front, the collaborators, they were involved in the panel. So we had representation from all the... Um, national bodies, or most of them, um, that are that involved, involved in stewardship. So the Delphi technique you know, enabled this panel of experts to reach consensus with consistently high levels of agreement. So we identified there were six um, overarching competency statements representing the knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that shape the judgments essential for antimicrobial stewardship. And I've put 55 there, it should be 54, sorry. 54 individual competency descriptors designed to reflect the level of experience of the learner and the type of practice setting. So we developed these 
competencies and said, well, if you integrate them throughout undergraduate healthcare professional education, those are what we identified were required um, when, you know, when um, students qualify. So the competency framework uh, has the potential to enhance the impact of antimicrobial stewardship education and improve clinical practice. And, co and it act, the framework complements, the, there's, prescribe, there's a prescribing competency framework out there and there's an antimicrobial stewardship and prescribing framework out there. So this framework is designed to complement those two frameworks and people that develop the other two frameworks are actually in the Delphi panel and were involved in this work. So we've now got, that's, that, so that's what we've developed, the competency framework. And the competency framework has been um, endorsed by NICE, um, which we were very pleased about. And several other rural colleges and national bodies have endorsed it. So, it provides, so really the competency, which we've, it's been published in the Journal of Hospital Infection, so I've got the reference at the end of the slides, but it provides a starting point for undergraduate healthcare professional education. It re represents a minimum standard and will be emphasised to a greater ex extent depending on professional roles. What we actually said was there's these 54 competency descriptors and depending on the role of the healthcare professional, some of those competencies are going to be more important than others. It depends what, what roles the different, health, different healthcare professionals are in. Um, and the competency framework could serve as a resource for other countries, but you've just got to be mindful that, you know, with the different healthcare systems. Uh, we have gone on and done some other work, and it's also been with a, a global panel of nurses, and we, um, we did Adelphi again, and we identified for nursing, they identi identified a further nine competencies that were important for antimicrobial stewardship. And that's because a nurse, obviously a nurse is, has got a different role than a pharmacist, has got a different role than a doctor or a physiotherapist. So that also has been published in the Journal of Hospital Infection. So we, we are saying what next? We need to do further, further testing and refinement to integrate and evaluate the impact of the framework in undergraduate healthcare professional programmes. So it's all very well saying our problem really now is we've got the framework there, but it's how do we get people to implement this framework? Um, and then we've, when people do implement the framework, we've got to evaluate the effect that it's actually having on, on, on learning and on practice. So that's quite a, a big stretch, actually. That's quite a difficult thing to do. But nonetheless, that's, that is what needs to happen. Um, so evaluate current AMS. So what we need to do is go... Nurse, uh, sorry, educators of undergraduate healthcare professional programmes need to map the competencies across their programmes, identify the gaps and then develop teaching resources to fill those, fill those gaps. So I have worked with a body called SCRIPT. Um, and they, we have mapped some of the competencies across foundation year doctor infection modules. And they found it very helpful because there were some gaps and there were some, you know, they needed to cover some, some of the competencies weren't there. So they developed teaching resources to um, cover those competencies. Um, and also the competencies could be used by regulators and professional bodies to inform pr proficiency standards and guidance. That's the, that's the reference for the AMS competencies. Um, what Enrique and I have done as well is, and it's just been published, is a book um, called Antimicrobial Stewardship for Nursing Practice. And we have used the competency framework to underpin the book. So each of the chapters, you, you, each of the competencies are covered throughout each of the chapters. Um, so that is avail on, available on Amazon and uh, Cabby, who are the publishers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I'm Enrique Castro Sanchez, and I'm a lead researcher at the National Centre for Infection at the Imperial College London. And uh, over the next few minutes, I'll give you some ideas about how we can uh, use nursing leadership to try to mitigate the impact of antimicrobial resistance. So Molly has presented to you the competences that we've developed as a result of the gap that we identified in this piece of work, where we wanted to see what kind of education nurses uh, well, actually, not only nurses, but doctors, pharmacies, dentists, and vets were getting about antimicrobial stewardship. Because you may remember that up until 2012, nurses really didn't appear in the narrative about proper use of antimicrobials. Then from 2012 onwards, loads of authors were saying, hang on, well, why are nurses not taking part in a stewardship? 
And the, the idea that we had was that maybe nurses were not getting enough education about appropriate use of antimicrobials in undergraduate education. So this study contacted all universities in the UK for those five disciplines, all the disciplines that use antimicrobials, and asked them what kind of education we're providing to students, anything from number of hours to whether they were including all the components of uh, antimicrobial stewardship as recommended by Start Smart and Focus, what kind of uh, evaluation we're offering to students. And I think it's quite powerful that you can see how some of the elements that traditionally have been thought of and not being uh, uh, elements that nurses are uh, uh, practicing are those that nurses get very little education or hardly any education. So you can see, for example, how, you know, we don't, um, and nurses are like the green dots, you know, other, other professions tell us, hang on, you don't really tell us that we should be reviewing broad spectrum antibiotics, but you can see how very few, um, I'll just come here, you can see how very few universities included that among the education. So this was a powerful piece of work that was telling us nurses don't get any or very little education about antimicrobials and at, the, at undergraduate level, and therefore that was the reason why we had to develop competencies. It's also quite important to know that probably as a result of that seminal work, the standards that kind of dictate what the nurses in the UK incorporate a statement that says that nurses will have to be confident and competent talking about antimicrobial stewardship. So every nurse and any nurse in the UK, and the standards were published at the end of last year, now need to be competent in antimicrobial stewardship. Of course, we can argue about what being competent means, and we don't really have metrics about what that means for the NMC, but I suggest that the competences that we develop are good enough, or really good, to try to meet that, that level. But it's powerful to see that now every nurse in the country will have to be competent in that area, and that is the first time that that statement, or a statement like that, is included or was included in the, in the standards. Now you may be thinking, okay, so uh, this guy is telling me that now we, as nurses, need to do something more. We need to do something about antimicrobial stewardship. And that's a common complaint uh, about this idea of incorporating more nurses in appropriate use of antimicrobials. Now I will challenge any of you who has got that idea to convince me that all these elements are not essential nursing care. I wouldn't call it basic nursing care, but essential nursing care. And all these elements are part of Start Smart and Focus. If any of you can convince me that uh, ensuring the adequate timing of antimicrobials is, is not an essential nursing care, or an aspect of essential nursing care, um, then I think, that, I think that I will worry. If any of you can convince me that obtaining uh, biological samples for microscopy culture and sensitivity is now an essential nursing job, task and role, then I think that you know, we will have a problem and so on and so forth. So when you go back to your teams and try to convince them about the need to uh, ensure that nurses are more involved in antimicrobial stewardship and they throw at you the usual complaint that now they need to do something more, I think that you can use this slide to say, no, this is all essential nursing care. You're not doing anything more, you just need to do what you're meant to be doing anyway. So can I go back to that last slide? Yeah, of course, yeah. Bottom on number nine, and it says surgical prophylaxis is appropriate. Yeah. You know, some surgeons just use it like Smarties, and others don't. So okay. You know, how can you actually say the nurse needs confidence to, to do this? What can you do about that? No, no, so I think that what I'm saying is like when people say you're asking me to do more, the answer that we should have as a profession is like, no, what we should be doing is being excellent in these domains of care. Okay, so the, that domain says that nurses, or, or you know, starts more than focus says, we need to require single dose surgical prophylaxis as required. Sometimes you may be able, you may need to give another one, but what is essential is, for example, for nurses to ensure, have we got single dose surgical prophylaxis given? Is it giving appropriately? Do we need to give another one? That is not antimicrobial stewardship. That is essential, excellent surgical care, in my opinion. So we're not saying to people you're doing more. You just need to do excellent. So they literally give it for every patient rather than a single dose. Rather than some surgeons don't, the one surgeon does. So 
so, so, we, so it's not it's not common practice for everyone to do it. Yeah, no, no, and of course we know that that surgical prophylaxis is a poorly is a poorly performed uh, um, you know clinical act. I'm not arguing that. What I'm saying is that from the point of view of nurses, our participation is not an add-on. It's part of our excellent essential nursing care. So uh, um, in terms of ownership, you know, again, often other professions say, OK, so nurses should be challenging inappropriate uh, performance in terms of prescribing or antimicrobial use. And that's all good and well, but we cannot forget that there are power imbalances between nurses and other professions. There are gender imbalances between nurses and other professions. And it's not as simple as saying, well, nurses need to be challenging in appropriate prescribing. If you decide to train and support your nurses to challenge, I suggest that we use approaches such as this one, where we create structured scripts so, and this is a fantastic experience from the Netherlands where people came up, people, I mean, a multidisciplinary team came up with, okay, so if you have to challenge someone, how would you like to do it? And if you were to be challenged, how would you like to be challenged? And these are scripts that all nurses will learn and all other professionals will learn that they will be used for their performance. And that way, people that are meant to challenge know how to do it, so they don't feel anxious about how to do it, and people who are challenged know what to expect. Now, this may sound quite innovative, but this is what is used in aviation industry and many other critical industries where people use structured information and structured communication. But the, the point of this is that we cannot just expect teams to do unless they are supported and trained to do, okay? And this is a wonderful opportunity to, to claim ownership because again, you see examples such as the, the chunk in yellow is the text that the European Commission guidelines for use of antimicrobials in humans um, said about the participation of nurses. So in a 143 page document, this chunk in yellow is what the EU Commission said that we were meant to be doing. Now I think that this is a dated document and we couldn't help but writing to them to say, this is dated, we could do more, we should do more, and we're willing to do much more. And this letter to the EU Commission was published, and we were able to now develop an EU-funded resource for not only specialist nurses, but generalist nurses, where we are supporting them to not only know, know more about antimicrobials, but to have different behaviors and different attitudes. The point of this, again, is that we need to influence policy and decision makers we cannot be sitting back waiting for them to tell us what we should be doing because, again, we need to be the ones shaping our behaviours and the course of our profession. Now, this is another example of that network and policy influence. When we, uh, the group of people that we thought we were working in antimicrobial stewardship came together on the first International Nursing Summit in Antimicrobial Stewardship, and as a result of that, we created not only a network of nurses working in AMS, which was then picked up by BISAC and funded and developed a, a web, but also we were able to analyze all the different positions that those nurses had in the country. So I was really interested to see what kind of jobs they had, what kind of jobs they were doing, where were they embedded in, so were they within an antimicrobial stewardship team or were they within a pharmacy team, infection prevention and control team? And in this paper, if you're thinking about developing nursing roles in AMS, we were able to say, okay, so essentially you could have three models of AMS nursing. You could come up with some kind of nurse consultant type, what we call a vertical model, which, you know, maybe interesting in terms of visibility because your organization will be saying this topic is important enough for me to put a nurse consultant in place but of course there may be challenges in terms of what kind of impact a single role would have and what kind of sustainability that single role may have and this is something that we were seeing from the mapping of roles that 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 we looked across the network so okay how much can a single person do you could uh, of course decide to go for the completely opposite option, which is to give more skills to every single nurse in the organization. Of course, that will have a dramatic impact because everybody will be able to do much more. But I wonder how much visibility we will give to the participation of nurses in AMS. 
because nothing will look different, although nurses will be doing much more. That may be much more cost effective, but also we could have synergies with other roles, thinking about IPC or sepsis and so on. Or you could go for some kind of hybrid uh, flavor where you don't really have a single professional, you don't have a nurse consultant, but also you give skills to just a group of people like infection prevention and control nurses or specialists and so on. So again, I think it's important to, okay, uh, try to respond to, to the challenge of nurses taking uh, more responsibilities in AMS, but we really need to think about how we do that. It's not good enough to just say, oh yes, we should be there because uh, um, that may have implications in terms of resourcing and quality and impact. And, and this, this work, I think, is important because of that, because it tries to answer the questions about how we could do it. Uh, networking will help, of course, to all these uh, roles and, and participation. Events like uh, such as this one and other events around the world where we can learn about what other people are doing. And it was fantastic to be able to be in South Africa learning from nurses who are delivering the bulk of TB and HIV care. And I cannot finish uh, at this particular point in time without mentioning Nursing Now because the whole sort of ethos of Nursing Now is not just to give visibility to nurses, isn't it? It's to ensure that mo uh, patients and citizens, and particularly those who are most vulnerable, get best and optimal care. And I think that this is a political opportunity to say to the policy and decision makers that we want to do much more. We want to be able to implement competences such as the ones led by Molly, but we also want to be uh, able to evaluate the impact that those policies have had. And again, these allow us to simply say, well, is the nurse, if the year of the nurse and the midwife, so uh, why not doing it now? And why not try new things that we haven't tried before? So uh, I thank you for the, for the time and for the opportunity.